Welcome everyone, so happy to be here on behalf of Support Kansas City. Um, as Adam said, this is in our leadership era, um, six nonprofit trends for 2024 and beyond. I could not help it, but bite into the Taylor Swift hype that everyone else has um, jumped off into. And so that's where the inspiration for today's title and slide deck design uh, came from. So let's get started. Um, what I hope to accomplish today during our time together really is to share, empower, and inspire you. Um, so starting with the share, I want to share with you how current trends and emerging issues impact nonprofit sector this year and beyond. Because as we know, trends don't neatly start and stop in January, start in January and stop in December, right? They kind of ebb and flow and kind of fade out and, and come back over time. So when I share that, also, I want to empower you to not only just hear this and say, oh, that was a great hour, but also to anticipate what these future trends can do to your organization so that you can adapt your organizations proactively as opposed to being reactive so that your organization can uh, remain relevant and effective, right? Because that's what we all hope for. And then lastly, the inspiration is gonna come from hopefully um, inspiring you to embrace a culture of continuous improvement. That's one of my favorite work words. Um, and innovation, positioning your organizations for long-term success and stability. And so when we get into the presentation, you'll notice on each slide, there's a, a little carrot towards the bottom that really has a question for you to think about what that trend would look like within your organization. So it's not really me just blabbering a bunch of stuff um, that I, I read on there, but also it's about hey, how, what would this look like in my organization? What would the barriers be to this in my organization? How easy would this be to do in my organization, right? So um, just some things for us to think about and hopefully take some action items back to our teams after um, we finish. So just a really quick overview about me. So I have over 15 years of nonprofit experience. Around about 10 of those have been in leadership. I am a Kansas City girl through and through. Um, I have degrees from Northwest Missouri State and UMKC, um, DNI certificate and a human resource management certificate. I've been on the board of SKC since 2020. I'm a wife to Justin, a mom to Amaris, who was 11 as of last week, Aria, who's eight as of last month, Prince the cockapoo puppy, who's three, and Kai the beta fish that Santa Claus brought for Christmas. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> but what I'm most excited about is jumping into our first trend. Um, which is collaboration. And so one of the things that uh, a lot of the literature that I reviewed talked about is increasing collaboration between various organizations. And this isn't just other nonprofits. It can be with for-profits, with hospital systems, with schools, um, in order to help move the needle more efficiently and effectively for our organizations. Um, also keeping in mind that one of the, the biggest um, pluses for Collaborating is that strategic partnerships foster trust among community and constituents while also building brand awareness, right? So if you think about your organization, if it, we all have our goals where we wish maybe we had a little bit more brand awareness, how do we strategically identify other organizations who have similar uh, scope of practice or who have similar um, uh, missions as our organization so that we can kind of put our resources together and have a bigger impact. And so one of the things that I want for us to kind of take away from this trend is who could you reach out to for a potential collaboration and meaningful partnership, right? Not just because they have the biggest name in Kansas City, but again, who were their synergy between your missions and your visions? Um, how would this collaboration increase your impact? Because ultimately we know that as being nonprofit leaders, a lot of our work is grant funded. Even if our partners in these collaborations are for profits, they're going to want to be able to go to their boss, their board and say, hey, we partnered with XYZ nonprofit and this is how big of a reach that we had. So be thinking as you're thinking of who we could collaborate with. Well, how would I, how is this going to increase my impact? And how am I going to measure that? And how am I going to demonstrate that? That's going to be very important. Um, so again, it's really important to ensure that we are um, forward thinking about, you know, using scarce resources, putting them together, pooling them together so that we can do the most good. Um, money doesn't grow on trees. I tell my kids that all the time, right? And so 
how can we leverage what we do have and you know, join with someone else, I think the philanthropy world will probably appreciate that because every talk I go to about philanthropy, it's like, hey, we get a lot of requests for children's services. We get a lot of requests for food banks. We get a lot of requests for those that are unhoused. Um, and so we have to, you know, make those difficult choices of who to say no to and who to say yes to. And sometimes they say, you know, if only these two organizations would get together, you know, that could be a bigger uh, impact. So collaboration, trend number one. Trend number two is alternative staffing solutions. So we know that we've seen a competition for talent like that has never been seen before, right? There's been um, record unemployment. Um, there's been, you know, lots of jobs open. Um, lots of the Burger King by my house is not open on weekends because they don't have staffing. And so, you know, they're only open Monday through Friday. Um, I've been to coffee shops. I went to Starbucks once and they were closed. They didn't open until noon. And I was like, isn't this Starbucks, don't they? This seems like a prime time to be open at nine o'clock in the morning because they didn't have staffing, right? So people are having to get creative. And that is not just in the service industry. That is in our industry as well. Um, so to remain competitive for talent in 2024, um, the use of consultants as subject matter experts is going to continue to be important. I said continue because a lot of us have used consultants and have already considered using consultants in the past, but this just says basically that is something that's going to continue. Um, this works well for both parties, the, the organization and the consultant, because you get someone who is an expert in exactly what you need them for. Um, you might not get much else, but you get exactly what you need. And then this also allows them the freedom to consult with multiple organizations or have work-life balance or whatever their uh, need is. Also something a lot of the research talked about was fractional staffing. Um, and so this is different than consulting um, and part-time work because it's not project-based. Um, it can be several places at once, right? Like I can work for X organization, Y organization, Z organization, all doing the uh, human resource consulting, right? Um, and so just think through, if you're a smaller nonprofit who could benefit from C-suite support, or maybe you would like a new HRVP or what have you, but you don't have the salary and the benefits to attract the talent that you would like to re re attract and retain, excuse me, um, then this is a way that you could get them there by hiring them part-time, um, just to come in and serve the need that you have for them. And then for them to go on kind of once you get things under control. Um, even if you're thinking about trying, you know, a new role, hey, we really would like to have a chief information officer because of all the data needs that we have and all the things that are evolving in the world, but we're not really sure, you know, how that's gonna play out. Start with a consultant or a fractional staff person. And that way you can kind of try it out and see how, like, do we really need this person? Oh, it was really great having that role. We That's absolutely something we're going to continue to fight for when we do our budget meetings and meet with our board of directors. Um, and so one of the things that's really important to consider around alternative staffing solutions are what roles are on your wish list that may be possible with the creative alternative staffing solution? A lot of times I know as leaders, we have wish lists. Man, I wish I could have. I wish if I could only hire or that's a great leader. I wish I could hire them. And, but we, we get stopped by what, I don't have the budget for that. Oh, they're probably going to want way more than I can afford, you know? Um, so before we shoot ourselves down, before we even get started, let's just dream a little bit and think about what roles maybe we would like to add to our team that we haven't thought of using in these type of, of ways, um, previously. So that can help us expand, um, the capacity of our teams. Trend three, I meant to tell you also, these are not in any order. They're just, this is the order I put them in the slide. So, um, but artificial intelligence could have been the first five slides because that continuously came up, whether you're talking about nonprofit, for-profit, just the world period. I know I've gone to a lot of public speaking uh, conferences and things of that nature. And there's either a track or a keynote on artificial intelligence. So it's, really, really big. It's getting bigger. It's not going anywhere. Um, and so just keep in mind that currently artificial intelligence is being successfully used. I want to make sure I point out successfully, right? It's not glitching, um, maybe some places, but not generally. 
for everything from fundraising to human resources, right? So um, I read stories about how people used um, chat GPT to review a grant that they wanted to submit, actually three grants, and they got all three. Um, I read stories about how uh, philanthropy departments were using chat GPT to write uh, donor thank you notes for them, which I mean, sometimes it is, especially if you have a really active donor base, it's hard to kind of think of what can I say that's not going to be the same road. We thank you so much for your support of our mission, right? Like you want to say something different. And so chat GPT, if nothing else, can give you a great place to start. And then you can make some edits and tweaks from there. Also human resources, you know, chat, uh, not chat GPT, I'm sorry, but artificial intelligence has been used in human resources for years. Imagine, and you hear people talk about all the time, if they're applying for a job, what are the keywords they need to alter in their um, resume so that it won't get filtered out, right? Because there's a filter that says, these are the things that we're looking for in this role. And if your resume, no matter how great it is, doesn't align with those key things, it never makes it to a person to see and review how great it is and how lovely the formatting is. So it's currently being successfully used, um, but the more we talk about it and the more it's kind of put in the hands of the everyday person like you and I, because of chat GPT, people get nervous, right? And so we've had the great resignation, we've had quiet quitting, we've had all of these trends. Well, artificial intelligence is bringing us FOBO, fear of being obsolete. So a 2023 Gartner survey found that 22% of employees expect AI to replace their jobs in the next five years. Um, and pretty much everything I've read said this is not accurate. It will change the way we work, but it won't necessarily change the fact that we work. People who want to work and have jobs should still be able to have that. Um, one of the things that was pointed out is look at it like this, especially for folks in nonprofit, is that with the use of artificial intelligence, this frees up humans to build meaningful relationships with your donors, with your constituents, with your community, right? So you're not spending as long writing these donor thank you notes or whatever things that you were previously doing that maybe now could be used um, as it relates to AI. Um, so what we want to think about as it relates to AI is once you begin to leverage AI within your organization, what policies need to be adapted or created for the responsible use of AI? And in what other ways do you need to protect your organization? So I previously worked for an organization that created a policy around the use of the OtterBox that um, people would have kind of joined these virtual meetings and it would go through and transcribe the meeting. And it was very new and it was very um, scary to people. And so it was like, nope, we're gonna write something down now that says we're not gonna be using this um, in our meetings because we need to figure out like more about it and how to control it and those sorts of things. Well, if you decide as an organization, we're going to embrace the AI transcription so that people can be more present in the meeting and actually focus on what's happening instead of taking copious notes, then that means that organization is going to have to go back and uh, edit that policy, right? Because now this is something that we're allowing because we know more about it and how to control it. Um, <clears throat> The other thing that that was uh, really interesting to me is that um, cybersecurity attacks are increasingly targeting smaller organizations and nonprofits, right? And so reading that was like, wow. So as we look to embrace AI more, I'm definitely thinking of how do we safeguard our organizations? We're opening it up to more technology, but we also need to put some things in place to help protect us and our organizations. So. Um, just something for you to be mindful of as we look to embrace AI as we move forward. Trend number four is impact communication storytelling. Um, so this is, I mean, it's just going to continue to grow. Again, not necessarily a new trend for 2024, but something that's going to continue to be more and more at the forefront of our work as we work with donors and try to help meet the needs of our constituents. Um, <clears throat> whether you're using blogs or podcasts, we have to tell our stories in meaningful ways that are gonna inspire action and impact, right? And hopefully the action is we want donors, we want uh, volunteers, we want people to talk about our missions, you know, word of mouth goes really far. Um, and so for people to be able to say, oh my goodness, this organization is doing really great things, that is, I mean, you almost can't pay for that. And so we have to make sure that we're lining all of our ducks up to be able to have this happen for us. 
Um, we know that donors are often motivated by the impact of their donations, right? Um, and it's important that it happens frequently. So we don't want it to just, it's great that it's in your annual report. Yay, you know, so-and-so gave X amount of dollars to this organization. That's wonderful. But how can that be something that is the gift that keeps on giving, right? Like, yes, I gave this amount of money and not only was it in the annual report, but maybe it was a blog or maybe it was a story that was told at a, an event that they had. Um, also, donors are wanting to see it in more than just kind of black and white. So the numbers, the reports, the grant report that you write at the end, um, you know, this is what we did with your money. This is what, you know, we really appreciate it. Those things are good. But we also know that hearing from those with lived experience, whether it's through uh, videos or um, interviews at events I've seen uh, companies do before, um, these are really things that kind of pull at the heartstrings and humanize our missions, which is kind of the point of what we do. Um, and it's also a great way to be transparent about where the funds have been used. Um, one of the things that I really want to make sure that we do talk about, though, as we look at leveraging these stories, because it can be done in lots of ways, um, is to make sure that we maintain the dignity of the persons that we do serve. And I think this looks a little differently depending on what your cause is. And so I know for myself, um, we actually just did this again, made a donation to Children's Mercy. My daughter was in the NICU. So if you Google me, there's an interview I did for Channel 9 probably 10 years ago. Um, my daughter was in a commercial for the hospital, right? Because we're so forever grateful that this small baby is thriving now and great and happy and healthy and all of those things. Well, imagine if I was a mom on drugs and I lost my kids and I didn't have anything and I was sleeping on the street, right? And so wanting me to tell that story on the news, there are some people who are willing to, but also just think about what happens if I turn my life around in five years and I get a, I get a great job, I get housing, I get my kids back. And then there's this story of me talking about the worst time in my life that's going to live forever on the internet, right? So how do we be thoughtful and intentional um, to make sure that the donors and the community that's going to rally around us feels the impact of our work, but also making sure not to overshare or expose or set um, our person served up for any potential stuff that could happen in the future um, is also going to be very important. So in thinking through this, it's important for us to consider what stories will grab your audience's attention and really resonate with them, right? You know, we talking to your frontline staff, they're going to have lots and lots of stories, some that you're not even aware of. Like, wow, I didn't know somebody said that they wouldn't have been able to, to make it to work if it wasn't for our transportation program. I didn't know that somebody said that we changed their life by having our food cabinet open or, you know, just all the different stories that, that they hear. So how do we take those stories and put them into the universe so that these can be heard and shared um, and also sometimes help other people. Oh, I didn't realize that that organization did that. I know somebody who needs that resource right now. Um, and again, do we have the infrastructure and resources needed to track and prove these outcomes? Because that's it at the end of the day, even though we told a great story, we had a great video, we had a great event, um, someone wrote a, a very moving letter about how our organization changed our life. Um, these are all wonderful things, but it doesn't change the fact that even in trust-based philanthropy, they want to know like, okay, well, how many people did you serve the year before? How many people are you now serving because of, you know, our, our contribution, you know, is your, your, uh, your program sustainable moving into the future, those sort of things. So these are all things that we still have to consider as we become more and more creative in how we share the work of our organizations. Um, moving along to trend five, flexible work arrangements. Um, so it's really interesting when I saw this because it's not just uh, work from home or hybrid work. I remember, I don't know if it was last year, maybe the year before, when I believe in California, they piloted a four day work week and there were people who were like, this is bizarre. I don't know what they're doing. Um, I'm sure some people were like, I hope it doesn't work because if it does, then my employees are gonna be asking for a four day work week. And you're right. A lot of employees are asking for a four day work week right now. Um, in a 2023 Gartner survey, um, they asked individuals 
if we were trying to recruit a new employee to our company, what would the top new benefit that would attract talented team members be? And 63% of them said a four day work week. So definitely this is something that is kind of catching on and building momentum. So it's not going to go back into the box, right? We can't put the toothpaste back in the, the, the container. It's definitely coming out. And so just expect for that to be a thing, right? Um, also, the demands for remote work are going to continue. Um, we know that benefits are flexibility for staff, decreased overhead, and increased talent acquisition power. And I think also, you know, that extends back to the four-day work week. Imagine your recruiter or whoever oversees your HR department trying to pull that staff, that member that's going to be so great for your team, whether they're, you know, taking them from another organization or whether they've kind of gone through a traditional interview process. And it's like, hey, well, guess what? If you come here, we have a four-day work week or you can work hybrid or it's 100% virtual, right? That's a great perk that a lot of people are looking to hear. And so, um, what you can't pay people in money, sometimes you could pay in flexibility. So that's definitely something that we want to continue to consider. Challenges um, with hybrid work or remote work continue to be building culture, collaboration, and communication. And it's not that these things are impossible. It just requires a lot more strategy. One of the uh, suggestions that I read was the key to being successful is setting expectations ahead of time. Um, I have a family member who works at an organization that has core hours. And so they absolutely have to be in the building um, between Tuesday and Thursday, the hours between 10 and 3. Um, but if they want to work from home all day Monday or all day Friday, they have that you know flexibility. If Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they want to show up at 7 in the morning so they can be done at 3 in the afternoon, they can do that. And so that is um, an another way that we can look at creative scheduling. However, we have to make sure in setting the expectations that we say, okay, you have this flexibility, but we have team meeting every Thursday from 12 to two. And so everyone has to be in person at that time or everyone has to be you know, uh, online and available during these core hours when we're trying to problem solve and work through certain things. Uh, because if we just jump into this head first and we don't set the expectations, that's when we see more issues with culture and collaboration and communication. If I stop by your office, multiple times trying to touch base on a project and you're not there and it's like oh yeah sorry I decided I'm working from home all week and it's like oh well I come into the office every day then that's why we've kind of been missing each other and so making sure that we know hey you know you have to communicate to your teams if it's flexible we these are the weeks that I'm working from home or these are the days that I'm working from home these are my in-office days um, just to kind of help us move the needle forward um so one of the things that I want you to think about when it comes to flexible work arrangements, and there is actually more data on the next page, but I really wanted to kind of put the question here for us to think about as we look at those numbers. What expectations would need to be set in your organizations to make a flexible working arrangement possible? Notice I didn't say, is a flexible working arrangement possible? Because some of us, there's like this thing that kind of creeps up, right? That's like, oh, flexible working arrangement. But what would I need to change to make that possible? If we were going to do it, any of these scenarios we've talked about, the core hours, the four-day work week, the remote work, what would we need to tweak in our organization to make this even have a shot at being successful without any service interruption, without um, missing a beat as it relates to people who um, are used to communicating with us, stopping by our offices, things of that nature? So <clears throat> I put these numbers up because I thought they were really interesting. And usually I don't like to read slides, but for me, I thought that this had such a great impact. So according to Harvard Business Review, 73% of those surveyed said that they feel that working in the office feels more expensive. Just feels more expensive than working from home. Um, and I mean, I, you know, if you think about overhead and utilities of your workspaces, you know, in, in some ways it definitely is um, not even thinking about the employee themselves and them needing to drive to work and whatever family arrangements they need to make to support that. 60% of employees surveyed said that the cost of going into the office outweighs the benefits. So we know the communication and collaboration is better in the office. However, I feel like I'm way more efficient at home. I don't have the random people stopping by my office for small talk. Like I'm not, you know, as easily distracted. Um, it helps my work-life balance because I can do laundry in between meetings, whatever the case may be. They feel like 
the cost of going into the office outweighs the benefits. Just, just let us stay home. 67% feel that going into the office requires more effort than pre-pandemic. This one kind of gave me pause because in thinking about it, physiologically, is that the case? Probably not so much. But I think it's like now that we have this awareness that it is possible for us to work 100% from home, um, we're like, well, hey, we know this now, so let's do this, right? Like, why go backwards? Like, let's keep moving forward with this. So that was interesting that people were like, um, it just feels like it requires more effort now. And then lastly, this is interesting, half of, or almost half of the employees who were surveyed say, these return to office mandates, they're for management. It's not for us. Like, this makes management feel more in control. It's not about what I feel like I need to be successful because to be successful, I can be at home by myself and not be interrupted, um, you know, and I can continue my work that way. So these numbers were uh, interesting perspective on, I know, you know, usually people are just like, yeah, we, we don't want to return to office or be mandated to return to office, but and kind of seeing it broken down this way, it just resonated differently with me um, this time. So that is what we have for our flexible working arrangements. Um, and then our last trend, which I could literally talk about this forever, um, our generational shifts, excuse me. So initially I had this weird idea that I was gonna create a band with singers from each generation because we have five generations in the workplace together now so that we could really see like hey what's it like to have Billie Eilish and Beyonce and Billy Joel like all on a team together right like because we can imagine that but literally that's what's happening within our organizations we have people of all these different generations that are in the same teams in the same meetings working for the same common goal in our nonprofit organizations and so we know that there have we've had this great diversity of generations in the workplace for some time but what we're seeing now is this what has been almost titled like this surge of generation z gen zers so um they are entering the workforce in record numbers right so they're just coming out and lots of them are uh reshaping the professional landscape um they are considered digital natives so the internet has always been a thing for as long as they've been conscious. Um, I vaguely remember when AOL started, the little noisy dial-up thing. So even millennials are considered digital natives as well because you know it's pretty intuitive and second nature to us because it's been around for a long time. So they have this unique perspective and expectation as being digital natives. Um, also, this demographic becomes more prominent um, their influence on workplace trends become increasingly pronounced. They are characterized as being tech savvy and socially conscious. Um, they drive changes in communication styles, work preferences, and the integration of technology into our daily operations. So Gen Zers place a premium on purpose-driven work, inclusivity, and flexibility, which challenges our businesses to adapt to these evolving norms because this is like the biggest group of individuals we have entering the workforce. So we have the Gen Zers coming in. We also have the millennials moving more and more into leadership roles, right? And so the challenge with this is managing the different expectations that are held by these younger generations. Um, Work-life balance, upskilling, how are you developing me for a future that might not be at your company. Let's keep it real, right? Like these two generations are known for kind of jumping around, right? Like if, if my needs aren't being met at this organization, or if I don't feel like I have opportunity for growth, um, if I don't feel like you support the social causes that I support, whether it's global warming or, you know, anything else that's happening, then I'm going to go find an organization that more aligns with that. Um, more focus on DEI and social issues. So it's really just going to be a shift in the way that we think in the way that we do business from an HR perspective on what are the rewards and recognitions that are going to help keep some of these Gen Zers and millennials within our organizations. Also, when we talk about recruiting these Gen Zs and millennials, like what kind of things, what benefits do they feel like we need to have as an organization that can do that? I read a, a stat that said that um, millennials are the most unsatisfied group 
in the workforce right now, uh, which was interesting to read. Um, and so they're all about, you know, wanting mental health benefits. Um, not only do they want benefit like insurance that covers mental health services, but also uh, the second, the highest second thing that they rated related to mental health was lunch and learns. Like, how do we bring speakers in and our organizations to talk about our mental health? Like, how are we doing? We're not okay. How do we talk about our anxiety, our um, just thoughts and feelings and, and all of those things? So even the type of benefits that we look for are different based on the generation that we were born into. And so one of the things that I want you all to think about is what areas should be prioritized in bridging the generational gap within your organization? Notice the question wasn't, is there a generational gap in your organization? Because nine times out of 10, if you have more than one generation represented in your organization, there's some sort of gap, but it's the areas. So like think of it maybe as departments because I feel like the differences don't just exist because I'm a millennial and this person is a baby boomer. The difference has come out when we have conversations about our new marketing strategy. Hey, I read XYZ company has a Snapchat that they are using to talk about the work that they're doing to end houselessness in the city or whatever is going on. And then you might have someone else who's like, why do we need Snapchat? I don't even understand that. Like we could just stick with Facebook. What's wrong with Facebook? We already have Facebook, right? So that's where you kind of see some of the differences the gala versus the new out of the box idea that maybe no one in our city has done or piloted before, but maybe someone from the events department saw on Snapchat or Instagram that was done in New York and was really successful with a similar cause. And so like, hey, we're, we're taking a gamble on this. So really think through where are the areas where, you know, I feel like that's where I should probably put more of my attention into bringing those two sides together, um, probably more than two since there's five generations, but bringing everybody together to meet in the middle and have discussions about how we see things. And it's not necessarily, I need to acquiesce so that this group can feel happy or pleased or fulfilled, but it's really about making each group feel heard and properly explaining like why we need to do something different or why we want to try something different. Um, or maybe sometimes we did something before and it didn't work and maybe we need to tweak the way that we implemented that and try it again to see um, how things, you know, change and if it has a, a different impact. 